Hi, I'm Carol Fontaine, and I am the Taylor Professor of Biblical Theology and History. I teach Hebrew Bible here. I occasionally teach a course in human rights. I teach the Hebrew language. And as you may imagine, I'm fairly enthusiastic about Hebrew scriptures. So I had the great good fortune to be raised in a dish of salsa in Miami, by which I mean it is a very diverse culture, so that I went to school and had my best friends with Jewish families. I lived in an African-American neighborhood. So uh, from my point of view, I always saw people going to synagogue or going to mass or some of them holding up snakes in the storefront of a building with very strange smells. And I just thought that was the way it was supposed to be. As it turned out, I fell in love with the Hebrew Bible at about the same time I fell in love with my husband, and I think there's something highly suggestive about that. <laughs> when I am the most ticked off at the Bible or God, I notice I'm not very happy with him either. <laughs> um, it, it, and he is a scientist. And so for those of you who really want to talk about the interfaith boundary, <laughs> let me just say, that when you've got somebody sitting right over there who says, is there any evidence for that? You really are encountering all of uh, the world there when you've got a scientist on deck. Well, so I have always taught at Andover Newton as though there were other religions. I have always also said, doesn't diversity and real interfaith respect begin in the past? We always choose certain ethnic groups in the Bible and demonize them and make them into the enemy that we must get rid of or handle. And so sometimes when we tell the story, we make out like we got rid of them all at once and it was a real bloodbath and we, did, we just wiped them all out. Hooray. God must have told us to, so aren't we good? And then you turn to the very next book where they say, and these are all the people they couldn't push out because they just didn't have the moxie. So you get the impression that from the get-go, the community of faith is living in the midst of peoples, and they don't all agree. Even ancient people are asking the question, can't we all just get along? The Hebrew Bible will, by and large, not come out and say, oh, you were wrong there, you 7th century people. But what they'll do is in the 5th century, they'll write you a story about how a foreign girl, one of those nasty Moabite girls named Ruth, somehow married a big honcho in Bethlehem named Boaz. And when she had babies, eventually the descendant of one of them was King David. OMG, what just happened there? Or about Esther. Now, Esther performed salvation the old-fashioned way, sealed with a kiss. Esther uses her body on behalf of her people. And since I volunteer for the United Nations, I call that sex trafficking. So, in fact, we have got a story about a nice little girl who's picked up by the people from the palace because she's real cute. She's forced into the trade. So when it's Esther's turn to try out for the Miss Persia contest and see if the king will keep her around after one night of fun, Esther is chosen. And because she becomes the Persian queen, by marrying a godless Persian, Esther saves all the Jews from genocide. So again, the Bible is not always going to give you a pretty story. It's not always going to give you a straight-out story, but it will make itself clear if you are willing to listen. Please don't hear interfaith as meaning, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all the same. We actually do know we're different. So interfaith doesn't mean we want you to be less of who you are. We want you to be more articulate as who you are. So, it, can I sum up what I think interfaith is from the point of view of a Christian? Yes, I can. It's nothing that you haven't heard before in the New Testament. Treat every person you meet as an example of the living Christ in that they are here 
so that you may stand before them in your full wholeness as a true spirit that welcomes them in love and compassion. So boy, do we need you. And we don't need you just to talk to New England. We need you to be able to go to Congress this week and raise holy hell, and I do mean that, with the Congress people who want to use Muslims as their next talking point to get elected. So you're living in one of the most exciting times, one of the most challenging times, but one of the times you can make a real difference. If you've got so much as a cell phone, you are part of a worldwide uprising for joy and compassion and hope. Uh, one of the things, I'm a specialist in proverbs and poetry, so I know you'll remember it better if it rhymes, okay? What is hateful to you, do not do to another. Treat the whole world as if it were your lover. This is my one true law, says God. This is my only way. Thank you. My name is M.T. Davila. It stands for Maria Teresa. And I'm from Puerto Rico. I am Roman Catholic, the only Roman Catholic uh, on the faculty. And um, that in itself is an interfaith experience here. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. I teach uh, Christian ethics, um, mainly focused on social ethics, uh, class issues, race, immigration, use of force and war, uh, and sometimes peace. And currently, I'm teaching a course on uh, consumerism and the environment, and we're having a lot of fun in that. But I wanted to talk about what my experience has been here with interfaith education through some experiences. Um, the first one is happened two years ago, I believe. Yes, two years ago, because my baby just turned two yesterday, and I, was, I had just had her when this happened. Um, on a uh, community day, which here in Hanover Newton Community Day is a joint practice between Hebrew College and Hanover Newton where classes are suspended and all students and many faculty, as much faculty and staff, uh, either go out into the community for special projects or remain here and reflect together and, and think together. Part of what they were doing was going out, doing assignments in groups and getting paid for those assignments and whatever was getting paid was going to go to uh, a church in Western Massachusetts, the Baptist church that got um, arsoned right after the election. So a group comes to my home and they clean up the yard, they clean up a garage that we were going to tear, tear down and I'm with the baby and we're having a great time and we all sit at the table for uh, lunch and tea and to share. And a uh, a Jewish student from Hebrew College is asking me what I teach, so I'm going to the same thing I just told you. He hears just for theory, and he's like, okay, well, I'm not sure I know much about Christianity, but I think some of what I know about Jesus, to be able to go to war and to justify, call it ethical, doesn't sound to me like something that adds up. Can you tell me more about how Jesus plays into your position on the use of force and, and war. And I was flabbergasted. I mean, no one had really stopped me to question me what that deep learning I had from my doctoral st studies and papers I've written and published on just war and whatever, um, that it wasn't truly maybe a Christian option for engaging others in love, because that's what Jesus came to ask us to do to engage others in love. And it was this Jewish man asking me quite earnestly and respectfully to try to explain that to him. How does that make sense to you? And we had a great conversation and an interesting conversation, but that encounter really questioned me and forced me to, to and many others, I have to say, to look at my own tradition, what I have uh, professed both faithfully, but also what I claim to teach in the classroom, um, how it is that it's faithful to its scripture, how it is that it's faithful to its major figures, how it is that it's faithful to the human beings involved in it and that believe it and carry it globally. That encounter has been very meaningful in how I structure my classes, actually. I always kind of ask that question, where's Jesus in your class? Where's Jesus in your class? Um, because that's my job. If I teach Christian ethics, then that's my job. 
and I need to do it well in a way that makes sense to a lot of people and in a way that I find faithful. So that, that's something that wouldn't have happened had the table in my kitchen had a different composition. It, it's, a, it's a jarring, jolting, stopping, um, reframing moment. It's a reframing moment. You reframe your reality. So that's been a great experience for me. But I want to um, speak more directly to a group I, I participate in, and Mark Heim as well, and a lot of us here on campus, uh, which is the ICPL, and you see some of that literature uh, on the table outside, the uh, Interfaith Center for Public Life. It was an enterprise begun by Hebrew College and Anover Newton, now an independent organization, that gathers together uh, leaders from all three Abrahamic faiths. So. Uh, Muslim leaders, Jewish leaders, Christian leaders, a few secularists, secular humanists. It's precisely when you hear the title, the Interfaith Center for Public Life, we consider in this group uh, issues that are relevant for, uh, for the public at the moment and how we can do a collective interfaith response that is respectful of our differences, but that shows some shared values that will also address whatever situation is happening. I'll give you two examples. Um, one very recent, which is on the occasion of the uh, hearings or the, the hearings that are being carried out by um, Peter King in Washington on Muslim extremism, we decided that we needed to act and write letters to uh, Massachusetts congressional um, delegations and um, senators uh, asking them to be very vocal against these hearings or at the very least to broaden the hearings to not target any one particular group but to look at extremism within Christianity, Judaism, and any other groups in, on US soil. Um, and that in fact targeting one particular group sets us back on agendas that were common to all groups. In my master's study, in my doctoral studies at Boston College, I had never thought to engage interfaith anything, multi-faith anything, um, until I was tapped you know, by this campus and tapped by the ICPL to say, come on board, this is what we do here. If you're here, you, you have to help us. And all of a sudden, my eyes were open and, and I saw this greater network of people talking together um, and not agreeing and talking together and um, not necessarily reaching any one conclusion, but sometimes yes. Um, and I was so touched or have been touched and, and shaped by the ability, the trust uh, that happens when you bring people together at a table and set some ground rules for conversation and what can happen from those conversations that uh, it blew me away. And now I wouldn't, every time there's a meeting, I'm like, okay, I'm clearing my calendar. I, this, I need to do this. This is part of what I'm doing here. Um, and I, ha I wouldn't have considered it a few years ago if it hadn't been for Anover Newton. So it's, the experiences, I have to say, it, you probably are asking, if I go to an Andover Newton, what will happen to me? <laughs> well, <laughs> you will be changed, you will be transformed, um, you will be deepened, you will be jarred. Um, and that, those are good things. Uh, because at least as a Christian, for me, um, jarring, being jarred is part of faithfulness, being faithful means not necessarily being comfortable in one's own position, that it means, in fact, having some sort of discomfort that lets us reach out and get to know more. So I hope that um, you've been asking questions, that this weekend has made you feel uncomfortable um, and also welcomed in that discomfort, <laughs> um, because I do feel very welcomed in that discomfort uh, here. Uh, well, I won't repeat the wonderful things that you've heard. So let me um, just say a couple of things. I, I teach theology um, here, and uh, I've been here a long, long time. Uh, Carol and I are ancient ones um, in this place. Um, theology is about um, understanding what you believe and about faith in trouble. 
Um, most theology is done because faith is in trouble for some reason. Um, I teach about theology and science. I teach uh, Baptist theology and polity for Baptist students. Uh, I teach world religions. I'll say a couple of things about interfaith, uh, the way it functions here at Andover Newton. Um, it can mean a lot of things, interfaith education. One of the things it means that's a new thing and a relatively rare thing is people of different faiths learning with teachers of different faiths together at the same time. That happens between Andover Newton and Hebrew College. Uh, a professor from Hebrew College, Nehemia Poland, and I team taught a course on the Messianic Age in Judaism and Christianity. Pretty interesting topic for Christians and Jews to be talking about together and to revisit our scriptures and our traditions about what exactly we mean when we talk about the Messianic Age or the Messiah. Um, very touchy in some ways, very revealing in many ways, uh, not dull in any way yeah. uh, on any of our weeks uh, together. That's one thing interfaith means, but it, that isn't the only thing it means. Sometimes it means studying about other traditions that are not your own, um, but with input and instruction from people who belong to that tradition. So when I teach Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, we have the Swami from the Vedanta Center, and we go visit the Hindu temple, and we visit the Islamic Center in Roxbury, and I mean, we have interaction, but we're mainly studying the tradition as a, as a subject. Uh, as our primary focus. Other times, we're sort of mending our knitting, mending our Christian knitting, supposedly, studying Christian theology, and interfaith means the sort of thing that's been eloquently expressed already. That is, realizing that this was never not connected with neighbors and others, never uh, uninformed by wisdom and truths from other perspectives. Thomas Aquinas was a great Christian medieval theologian. He wrote a famous book called Summa Contra Gentiles. Who were the Gentiles that he was thinking about? I never asked that question throughout all my doctoral study. It didn't seem to be necessary. But once you get into an interfaith environment, it becomes really important. He was thinking about Muslims, Jews also, but especially Muslims, because Jews and Christians could argue together about the Hebrew scriptures they shared. Christians and Muslims didn't share that kind of scriptural basis, so they had to argue on some other basis. And all of Christian theology was sort of reframed with that task in mind. So it has to do with how we become ourselves, or how we re-understand the way in which we are ourselves and our traditions, and all the input that's come from interaction with other traditions along the way. Um, it means a lot of non-curricular things, the ICPL, the community days has been mentioned, the, the circle fellowship and so on, and the, the ways in which people, just by living together, eating together and so on, planting trees together, doing whatever sorts of things we're doing, you're informed by the perspective of others. And, you, and whenever you, whatever you do, read a book, read scripture, worship, all of that is somehow functioning in your life and your practice and your perception. You can never be the same that you were before you had classmates, friends, colleagues, coming from these different perspectives. But interfaith always means faith first. The interfaith project is about bringing living faiths into connection with each other. So we're not a religious studies institution where we think about what other people believe and practice our always, our primary focus is always, what do we believe and practice? So it's faith speaking to faith. Carol is exactly right when she says it's not about being something intermediate, mild, dumbed down. It's about learning to be something more vivid, more aware, more alive uh, as a member, as a participant in a faith community. That's enough. Let me let me stop.